actually, one of my first question is, how many people here have used Grubhub? Just so I, all right, has, is, does anybody have no idea what Grubhub is? Cool, so my first slides won't be. Um, all right, uh, second question, less of a question, more of a comment, I guess. Um, my last name, if you're really curious about how to pronounce it, it's Chaya, um, it's Polish. Remember it just by saying hi, it's Chaya. Um, all right, so let's uh, get into this. So I'm gonna be talking about kind of more of a personal story about this project I ran for Grubhub um, uh, in kind of revamping their persona tool, taking what was there before, figuring out why it wasn't working, um, figuring out what's gonna work, um, and then the whole kind of process, challenges, missteps, all that, and um, then what, it's, what it is today. All right, so um, you guys have all seen, sounds like most of you have used Grubhub, but um, for the very few of you who haven't, um, this is not what it looks like today. This was 2004, thanks to the Wayback Machine um, at archive.org. But so uh, it started in 2004 by two hungry web developers who wanted an alternative to the paper menu. So they wanted a way to um, browse multiple menus, order online, kind of bring it up to speed um, with the 21st century. So they created Grubhub.com where users could go on, look at multiple restaurants, multiple menus, and order directly online for delivery. Um, so 2014, the company went public. All right, and this is generally what we look like today. Um, seems like, like a lot of you guys are familiar. Um, so yeah, we've grown a lot, expanded a lot. Um, I'd say we're kind of one of the big guys in the space, although it's a quickly growing space and a lot more competition. Um, so things have grown, we're nationwide, 50,000 takeout restaurants in over 1,000 cities. Um, so we've evolved you know, in the market space. We've also evolved a lot internally as a company, so growing our um, design capabilities, product management capabilities. Um, you know, as a company internally, we've grown a lot uh, through some growing pains with that. Um, and then we're kind of grow, trying to grow more in, um, in what we do. So growing more into like just the food content space itself and really trying to understand what that is and be a little bit more than just a place for delivery. Um, uh, this is our lovely UX research team of which I'm a part. You might, have, might also recognize Richard because he's here today. Um, and we all kind of focus on different aspects of, of the, um, the company. So I focus on the, what we call the diner side. You'll hear me probably say diner a lot. That's what we call our users who use the, the food ordering space. We also do restaurant um, and driver stuff. All right, so let's dig in. Um, so like I said, I'm gonna take you through just kind of my personal story with this. Um, and uh, so as we've uh, evolved internally, um, we kind of wanted to evolve our tools as well. Um, and this project came to me last year with this big question, right? Really big question up there. Um, and it looks simple, but when you start to unpack it, it's actually pretty complex, because this question means something completely different depending on who you're talking to in the company. And that was one of the first challenges, is understanding, okay, all these people are saying this internally, all my stakeholders, product managers, designers, directors, all that. We wanna know our diners, what does that mean? What about them do you wanna know? People are complex, so this question could have a lot of complex answers. Um, it was also really interesting because we had a set of personas um, that was supposed to answer this question, right? Um, and when you look at these, um, you know, they look kind of like typical personas that you might see if you Google personas, if you've done them before. Um, these were well-researched uh, by a, a researcher who was at the company for a while. Um, I looked through her data and her method and all that. It was solid, right? And so I really needed to understand why were these not being used? Why did, why did we still have this question? We wanna know our diners. Why was this tool failing? Um, so I initially treated this project kind of like internal research, right? My, our st my stakeholders were kind of my first participants to figure out, all right, these aren't working, why? So um, did a lot of interviews and, and then also just observed teams using them, observed the designers using them, observed product managers using them, um, and I learned a few different things for why they're not working. Um, any takers, any guesses? It's like usability 101. Uh, don't make me think, <laughs> first off. So there's a ton of information here. Um, and 
you know, so these are supposed to be empathy tools um, to get to know who you're designing around, what you should know about, you know, our users that you're supposed to design around. And there's so much information here to unpack that it takes a lot of work to read through, digest all this information, try to understand like what is important about Jessica that I need to know if I'm designing a feature or a, you know product for her. Um, what is most important to know about Brandon? Um, which one should I even design for? Which one is going to be you know um, is going to um, want to use this feature, or w which one is it going to help? Um, and then you can't, comp they're, they're hard to compare. These are all the things I observed um, and that I got from the observations. Um, so, and most importantly, these can't really scale. You can't really do a survey based on these and find like how many Brandons are there, like how many 23 year olds who live with two roommates and do all these things exist. It's just not really feasible. Um, and then they can't change with time. So, um, I think one of the challenges with a tool like Personas is in a quickly changing space, how do you adapt your understanding of users as they change, as the space changes, when a lot of this information is very static based on the features, um, current features of the product. So if that changes, these are kind of, you know, outdated. Um, looks like I have to just point this this way. All right, oops, spoiler alert. Um, so what happens <laughs> when things aren't working is you get teams starting to create their own personas. And this is okay, we call them proto-personas if you don't have a tool that's working. Um, it's pretty common practice. But what happens when you know, all these little teams are creating their own personas, um, you get a lot of different personas. And the biggest problem with this is you're not designing for reality because it's just way too easy to create a, the perfect persona that perfectly fits what you're trying to make your product for, right? <laughs> Um, and then there's no saying how that's actually going to work because you fabricated this imaginary person that, based on your assumptions. Um, and then we have so many of these proto-personas that we're not aligned as a company on who we're designing around. So um, the challenge with that is like, you, you know, you're, if you're designing around so many different users um, with all your different features, then you're going to have a pretty disjointed experience end to end for any user. Um, so at this point, Things got messy. <laughs> um, this is like the point of the project where things are just kind of ambiguous, right? Like I have, I know why things aren't working, but now we have to move on to that part where we try to figure out what's going to work. Um, the last thing I wanted to do was to recreate these lovely personas that then don't get used. Um, those were created in 2000, the beginning of 2015, so they weren't even that old, and they felt outdated to the team and, and not working. Um, so, all right. We have all of these assumptions. Um, all these stakeholders have this different understanding of this question. We want to know our diners, different opinions about what we need. So um, at this point, it's, it's really like that part. Sorry, I feel like I'm getting louder. Um, the part in research where you have to take all of this information that you're doing and you have to just distill it down. So um, I took all of this internal data and just distilled it down and, and I like this metaphor because it's like taking these raw complex ideals and just ideas and just boiling it and boiling it and boiling it down so you get to what you need. Um, so these are kind of like the guiding principles that I, I learned is what we need as a company in this tool um, with what we want to create, the direction we want to go with these. Uh, number one, they need to be memorable artifacts that represent what's most important about our users. Um, so remember with those previous personas, there was just a lot of fluff a lot of like extra information that didn't really zero in on what was really important about that person in their relationship to food and how they made food decisions. Um, and then they need to be memorable as well. So um, simple enough, focus on what's important so you can really remember what's you know, what they, you need to know from them. Um, they should be tools that can represent a common language between people and teams. So if we all have different understandings about what that we want to know our diner's question means and how to unpack it. Um, uh, we really want to create a tool or aim for this goal that can be a common language. So um, coming back to that idea of it being an empathy tool. Um, so something that anybody from any you know, perspective from the company could look at it and understand it um, and digest it. And then a foundation. So. Um, going into this, I tried to kind of let go of my assumptions for what a persona should look like and really focus on what it does as a tool and it should accomplish these things. Um, and it was also important for me um, and, and as a company as well to, I think, focus on this idea that they're going to change. Um, 
and you know, so we can create insights and or we can discover insights and create this tool, but and things are going to change, but they shouldn't always conflict with that change. They should be able to grow themselves and be evolved as we learn new things, because we are we're, we have an internal research team. We're always learning new things as we go. All right, so where do we go? <laughs> How do we start this? Um, so on a lot of reflection on what those things mean for Grubhub, I realized it really means starting here. Um, so this is like the prime empathy, um, empathy point for Grubhub and what we really care about as a company um, and what I really care, oops, sorry, what I really care about discovering um, is people's relationship to food, right? It's in this moment, this like simple moment. Um, you know, why is that girl so happy to eat a burger? Um, you know, what was it about that decision? Um, how can we discover the different relationships people have with food and how, why they make decisions? Um, so, uh, all right, so we're gonna do some research now that we know we have the, all distilled down, we have kind of our goal in mind. Um, what do we need out of the research part? Um, so first, um, you know, my background's in UX, so I care a lot about behaviors as opposed to attitudes. And for this project and for these types of personas, I felt it was very important to focus on the behavioral part because, um, you know, as a company, we were very, one thing I heard over and over again, aside from we want to know our diners, is we want to understand their habits um, and how can we build better habits with our diners. So we had a very strong interest in their behaviors over just their attitudes. Um, and we really want to understand what they do not necessarily what they say. Um, what they say is still very important because it represents that aspirational and attitudinal, attitudinal side of their decisions, but it really comes down to what are they actually doing in their food decisions. Um, so we want to base our personas and our tools on that. Um, and we want to make it very diner-centric. So um, this is a, uh, um, an important one because um, some personas are created based on just usage data, on, on how people are actually using the site, and they're very focused on just how the user uses the site, right? But then you're completely ignoring this like whole other space of their lives. And I think it's also really easy when you're working within a company to get kind of this like bubbled mind view of how people are eating and involved or existing in the world. Um, you know, like every time somebody thinks delivery or thinks food, they should be thinking Grubhub. But that's not reality in, in our users' world, right? They have so many other food decisions, and it's really about understanding from their perspective how they're making decisions and then how Grubhub fits into it, not really the other way around. Um, and then really just like zero in on that relationship to food, because this is where we're going to find that common ground and that um, kind of behavioral simplicity. I really want to get down to like what's at heart in those decisions and that relationship and take a broad view of that. All right. Um, so in terms of a research method, I decided to do um, a 10-day diary study. Um, a diary study because you, I wanted to get, I mean, like ideally in my mind, I wanted to kind of shadow their lives throughout a week to understand how and when they make all kinds of food decisions. Um, and somebody makes you know, a completely different food decision at lunchtime than they do at dinner, and then they do at breakfast on the week, on the weekend. Um, so I really wanted to capture that fluidity of their lives um, from their perspective. And I also felt that doing a diary study, I might kind of limit some of that self-reported bias that you can get from just surveys and interviews where people are really just talking aspirational. But I felt like, you know, long enough diary, they're going to slip up and kind of go with their habit, right? And I'm going to be able to see their habits regardless of, you know, what they want to be doing. Um, sorry, there's the, my font got changed, I think. <laughs> Imagine that S is right uh, in the W. Um, so, and then followed up with in-depth interviews just to get, so the diary study is going to give me this, like, huge swath of data, um, but, you know, possibly kind of shallow. Um, and then the in-depth interviews just to follow up with some of those participants to get depth on their attitudes and their, um, their perceptions, how they felt about their diary. Um, you know, 10 days is kind of a long time for a diary already. And then follow up with quant in order to scale against our, our <coughs> user base and understand um, um, just from our insights that we learned from this, how that matches back to our actual population of users. All right, so um, we're going to need a lot from a tool. <laughs> um, we're going to need robust recruitment. We cared a lot about getting different markets and, and making sure that we weren't, um, you know, biasing ourselves with certain, we have some hypotheses, I guess, about how different markets eat. Um, 
uh, I wanted to give people, participants, you know, 10 days is a long time, especially if you're, you're asking for their food, every food decision. Um, so something that can handle that just a variety of types of responses so it doesn't get boring for them. And so I can um, have just a range of different types of data from them. Um, solid analysis is kind of obvious and I'm going to get a lot more into that. Um, and then the ability to condu uh, conduct follow-up interviews with those diaries study participants. All right, so this is our prompt for the diary. I ask people to do, try to do at least two meals a day. Um, ideally, they would do all of them, but you know, we're human. Um, so anytime you've made a decision, I just want to know what plays into that and how you feel about it. Pretty simple. All right, uh, how did all of that go? So the, um, the diary study, you know, went well. I really felt like it was a good method. I, I you know, felt like I got a slice of their life, saw a lot of things. Um, Analysis, this is where I ended up. Um, I don't know how many other people have been there, but um, this is a scary place to be at this point. And I should mention that um, you know, I was the only person on this project running it, doing it. Um, so how did I get here? So I was alone on this island doing this analysis, right? <laughs> Um, not because I didn't have help. So we, I work in a very collaborative office and collaborations encouraged and all that, but in this case it was kind of, you know, um, what was that, that thing we learned about the, the mum, that principle we learned with the Fitbit, sorry, I forgot it. Mum effect, thank you. Yeah, this is exactly what's happening here. So, um, so I'm on this project by myself, trying to figure out this analysis. I've got analysis paralysis. Um, I have people offering help, but I think the challenge for a researcher sometimes is when you have a designer offering help is you've got these spreadsheets of analysis tools. How do you onboard someone to help you digest that and process that? Um, and even more than that, you know, I have so all this, I have tons of data. Um, I have it tagged in a million different ways, organized in a million different ways, um, but I just was stuck at this moment where I needed to go beyond just that analysis part to synthesis, right? Like digesting what it means. And I got this, you know, kind of terror, terror moment where there really wasn't a silver bullet for helping me um, do this. Had a lot of expectations for the tool I was using when it came to the tagging and helping me do that analysis, but in practice realized it really wasn't getting me the kind of depth I needed to get to. Um, I really needed like, more of me, more brains, more people <laughs> on, this, on this project to digest this data in a way that was meaningful and that could get me somewhere. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, this is how that all went. Um, all right, so how do we get, how do we get beyond that? Um, things aren't working out the way they are. Um, there is a solution and it's just more people. And the right amount of people, so this is a, um, a, another lesson is just involving the right people um, to help you and um, and this is more meaningful than just like people to help you plug and chug through those data sets and through through all that qualitative feedback um, this is going to become a lot more important um, as I'll talk about so I'm going to get into that right now um, so I had a content strategist on my team um, a designer some product managers um, and uh, so I pulled them into a room, threw them in the deep end with me. I think there was some shock when they saw like, the type of data I was dealing with and how much of it. Um, but we were a lot faster together working through how we we're going to get through it. Um, and we, we kind of we took, took the technology part away. It was really about connecting with who those, who those users were as people. Um, so we wanted to you know, get back to our goals, make sure we're focused on that. Remember, we're trying to get to know our diners, build this foundation, um, zero in on what's really important. Um, so we went about doing this collaborative analysis technique where, um, so I had their diaries kind of all printed out in just linear form. And then we each took um, three, three participants each and spent a week just like diving into that data and really getting to know this person. So beyond what you could do with tagging, just tagging and looking at word clouds, it was really like reading through their decisions in context of the day before, in context of later in the day, in context of all the other pictures and data that we had, um, and, and their interview and, and, and how um, their interview and what they said related to what happened in their diary. Um, 
and then uh, we had kind of a worksheet that focused on those parts that we were, you know, just to kind of help structure what we were learning from them. So the relationship to food, motivations, aspirations, challenges. Um, so we spent about a week doing that um, and then all got back into a room together. And again, just like no technology, no laptops open in the room. This is off of um, Excel, um, just purely post-it notes. Post-it notes are like the best friend of UX. It's like peas and carrots. Um, so we took all of those insights that we, we learned, put them onto post-its, and then just went about again, like distilling and distilling and affinity, affinity diagramming those insights from those diaries and the interviews um, and came up with things like their relationship to food, their decision process, you can't read this, but I'm gonna describe it, um, how they approach health, all these different aspects. And, and the challenging part here is like at which point, so, so our goal is to find out these different types, right? Different types of users, but what aspect of them do you use as like that defining difference? Like it could be approach to health, it could be, um, you know, uh, lifestyle is another big one that people use for personas. Um, we decided for us again, going back to that relationship to food, that um, those food decisions, all the different types of food decisions people make, um, you know, what are the, the different personality types in that space um, based on what, what we've learned here. Um, so I can't, I can't share all of our personas, but I wanna share like our main four types that we learned based on this, which I think are really cool. Um, so first we have our cravers. They're kind of either a craver person, craver moment, craver experience. Um, this is really that moment where food is about satisfaction. It's really about finding the perfect thing in that moment. Um, and it's a, lot, it's a very like mood-driven moment or behavior. And then we have uh, the foodies. So for the foodie, it's really just the experience. It's about the ambiance. They're a lot more intellectually and socially driven. Um, they care a lot about quality. This might be the person that likes to um, take pictures of their food and put it on, on Instagram. You know, the people that like stand on their chair and um, go over, make sure it's like a really good quality photo to share. Um, they might keep up on food blogs, that kind of thing. And then we have pragmatists and this behavior. Um, and for this one, it's really just sustenance. You know, it, these are the people that might think ahead, plan ahead for an easier decision later. So this is the kind of person that might eat the same thing for lunch every day because it's easy or because it's healthy or because it, you know, sticks to their budget. Um, and then the opportunists, they're just very opportunistic about their food decisions. So it's very necessity driven. This is the type of behavior where you might, you know, forget your lunch and you need to find something really quick. There's an urgency involved with that. Um, so raise your hands. Any, any cravers in the room? Anyone feel like they're a craver? <laughs> How about foodie? A pragmatist? about opportunists? I see a good mix, yeah. And, and what I found too is like there, there's a lot of overlap and um, what's been working about these is remember we wanted something that was a foundation that was flexible um, that we could build on. Um, so these can be either behavioral, um, they could be aspirational for people. Like we found people who are very aspirationally foodies but behaviorally things don't, weren't always working out, right? They tended to be more be opportunists for one reason or another. Um, so in using this type of persona breakdown that's very behavioral and gets at heart at like that behavioral decision, if you're, but that can also speak for an aspiration, um, if you're designing for you know, a behavioral foodie or an aspirational foodie, you're kind of covering those bases. Um, so, so yeah, with our older personas, they were really static very narrow um, on who they were describing. Um, and they represented this kind of fluffy hypothetical person, right? This imagined kind of false, um, I've heard them called, being called bullshit personas um, because they're so fluffy and inauthentic. Um, and moved to this kind of more very just modular, flexible um, breakdown of, of user types that represent something that's either habitual, aspirational, or contextual. Um, so some of these might even just be contextual, like certain external things might drive you to be one or the other. Um, 
Uh, we're using them in a number of different ways too. Um, one of the, the ways we found really helpful is just storyboarding with them. Um, so that's like a whole other topic and in interesting field of UX is storyboarding and, and involving stories in your design um, exercises. So how an opportunist orders a burger on Grubhub might look very different from how a foodie orders a burger on Grubhub. Um, so it's a really neat exercise to do with the team to understand those different needs um, for the, the same, like, you know, what would be the same path or similar path to be very different. Um, and then they're continuing to evolve. So right now um, designers are taking them and, and kind of turning them more into a tool um, that works for them, that, you know, kind of designing with themselves in mind as people that are going to be using them. And then um, we're working on the, the quant part, so validating and scaling them, because we do have this question of, you know, how many foodies do we have? And, and it's um, really useful to know as well, like, um, so, you know, how many of those types are we actually serving well through the platform versus which ones are we not really serving well? And then that gives us really good opportunities to grow um, and, and aspire to ourselves. So, um, this was a, a project of a lot of lessons learned myself. <laughs> um, and you know, if you have a lot more experience, you might know some of these things already. Um, so if I ever do this again, um, I would definitely trust humans over the technology that I have a lot of assumptions for. So it ended up not really fulfilling what I needed it to fulfill in this case. Um, and, and also, so this is that part that I wanted to get back to where um, you know, technology can't really fulfill these other two points in, in helping you make decisions and triggering you thinking about what things mean, you know, like it can help you tag things, it can help you, you know, like digest that, tell you how many, give you a word cloud, but like what does that mean in the context of being human? You know, how much can a tool really understand what it means to be human versus a human, that empathy piece, what a human can understand of another human making decisions. Um, and then also the people on this, this team, they're, they're my best evangelists of this tool throughout the company. So the people who have really taked it, t taken it and kind of like helped it evolve and, and brought it to new places that I wouldn't be able to do on my own. Um, uh, embracing ambiguity as a team. So a lot of the really scary parts of this project were the ambiguous parts where you don't exactly know what the right way to go is, especially in that like analysis paralysis part. The hardest part was bringing more people in to this chaos that like I don't even know how to solve quite exactly right. Um, but I guess embracing and not letting that stop you is really what helped get us forward in this. Um, and then just remind yourself they're not going to be carved in stone. So I think you know, as a researcher, sometimes it's hard to not be perfectionist about some of your, um, you know, what you're trying to get out of this. But um, yeah, just reminding that it's, it's really about like this process. I don't know if anybody's ever seen this, but this is like the MVP process where, you know, designing a car doesn't start with just like the wheels. It's like designing a little bit along the way. Um, so yeah, starting small and then stress testing and uh, building a foundation. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Julia. So, questions? All right. Jens, you going to make it over? Yep. I'm making Jens do all the steps, which is not good for my Fitbit, unfortunately. But. I'm curious if you encountered this, because this is something I've encountered with personas, um, where you have a persona that's based on attitudes, behaviors, and then you try to put specific demographics mm -hmm. to bring it to life, but yet your persona could be male or female, but if it's more female, it gets personified as a woman, and then forever on, it can never, you know, in people's mind, it can never be a male, and, and how did you deal with that? Yeah, so that, I mean, that's still pe something people ask is like, are we going to put a face to these? Are we going to give them names? Um, I, I feel strongly against it um, just because I want to I keep them honest and authentic. And I feel like when you start putting names and faces, there's so many other assumptions that people make, wrong assumptions, right? Like, and another one that, you know, I've heard is, you know, you're, you're such and such age, you must be not tech, um, tech savvy but I really don't want us to think that way. It's really about focusing on what's important, like the behaviors, because demographics, like all this extra information kind of gets in the way, in, in my mind, of, of what's really important to design around. Yeah.